Since uh, Professor Labodi couldn't be here, uh, John Wesley and I will try to speak to you today. This was actually the sermon I was intending to give next week. Um, in fact, next week I'll be talking about Ch John Wesley's brother Charles, uh, although I won't be doing one of his sermons. Um, I know uh, a man named Doug Anderson, who's a church consultant that likes to refer to John and Charles Wesley as Jack and Chuck. Um, John Wesley was actually known as Jackie to his family during his whole lifetime. I have a daughter who uh, challenged me on my choice of sermon. She must have been paying attention during confirmation. Um, she said, why aren't you talking about Jacob Albright or Philip William Otterbein or Martin Bame? Now, if those names are not familiar to you, they come from the Evangelical United Brethren side of the United Methodist family. Um, these were uh, church leaders in the Evangelical United Brethren churches in the United States. But since our church uh, came originally from the Methodist tradition, you'll be stuck with Jack and Chuck. Now, John Wesley uh, published 44 standard sermons in four installments beginning in 1746 and concluding in 1760. And these 44 sermons, along with his notes on the New Testament, became the standard doctrines for Methodists. Um, the sermon which I have picked is one of 13 of the 44 that he did on the Sermon on the Mount. And the sermon that I have picked specifically is because it is based on the programmatic text I've been using for this series of sermons for our bicentennial, You Are the Salt of the Earth, You Are the Light of the World. Now I must tell you that uh, to read this sermon in its original would take uh, about an hour or more, and it would be in language very difficult to for us to understand because the syntax and rhythm of speech 250 years ago was significantly different than our speech patterns today. So for, to be merciful to you, I have uh, reduced this sermon to uh, fit the allotted time, as it says in the bulletin, and have literally rewritten virtually every sentence that I'm using so that it's easier for you to hear and understand. And in some cases, I've changed uh, the word usage because the word usage has shifted dramatically in 250 years. So let me offer a prayer, then I'm going to read the text and share with you John Wesley's words as they have been modified. Let's pray. Many years ago, oh God, John Wesley spoke words which quickened the spirits of those who heard and deepened their faith and drew them forward to a more profound discipleship. And as we hear his words today, we pray that we might receive them with open hearts. We pray that our spirits might be lifted, that our discipleship might be made more profound, that we might be more faithful in following our Lord and Savior, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. The text is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Amen. In order to explain fully these important words, first I will show that Christianity is essentially a social religion and that if we turn it into a solitary one, we destroy it. Second, that to conceal this religion is impossible as well as contrary to the design of God. Third, 
I shall answer some objections and conclude with a pr practical application. By Christianity, I mean that method of worshiping God which is revealed to us through Jesus Christ. When I say that it is a social religion, I mean that it cannot exist at all without society, without living and conversing with other people. Not that we can condemn mixing times of solitude with the time we spend with others. We need to withdraw from others every day to engage in prayer with God, at least in the morning and the evening, nor can we condemn using longer periods of time when we retreat for prayer. Yet separating ourselves from others for prayer shouldn't use up all our time. The religion described by our Lord cannot exist without living and conversing with other people. Now you might naturally ask, should we only interact with good people, only with those we know to be meek and merciful, holy of heart and holy of life? Wouldn't it be useful, you might ask, to refrain from any interaction with people with the opposite character, those who do not obey or perhaps do not even believe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is certainly advisable not to have close company with them or with any workers of iniquity. To be in such company necessarily exposes a Christian to an abundance of dangers and snares out of which the Christian might not find deliverance. And yet, we can't break off all commerce with the world because according to Jesus, we can't be Christians at all unless we have some contact with non-Christians. Some interaction with unholy and ungodly people is absolutely necessary in order to fully exercise the Christian temperament. Mercifulness, whereby we love our enemies and bless them that curse us, do good to them that hate us, and pray for them which despitefully use us and persecute us, couldn't exist if we only interacted with real Christians. And this is the great reason why the providence of God has mingled you together with other people who do not believe, so that whatever grace you have received from God may through you be communicated to others, that every holy temper and word and work of yours may have an influence on them also. By this means, a check will in some measure be given to the corruption which is in the world, and a small number at least saved from general infection and rendered holy and pure before God. Our Lord shows the desperate state of those who do not impart the religion they have received, which indeed they cannot possibly fail to do as long as it remains in their own hearts. He says, if salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and trod underfoot. If you were holy and heavenly minded and zealous in good works have no, and have no longer that savor in yourselves and no longer season others, if you've grown flat, insipid, dead, both careless of your own souls and useless to the souls of other people, how can you be recovered? Can tastelessness be restored? If you'd never known the Lord, there might have been hope. But what can you say when he says, Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, the Father takes away. He that abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. If someone doesn't abide in me or doesn't bring forth fruit, he's cast out and thrown into the fire. Toward those who've never tasted of the good word, God is indeed pitiful and of tender mercy. But justice takes place with regard to those who've tasted that the Lord is gracious and if afterward turned back. If we thus sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there is judgment and fire. Although we may not wholly separate ourselves from humankind, although it be granted we ought to season them with the religion which God has brought into our hearts, yet may not this be done insensibly. May we not convey this to others in a secret and almost imperceptible manner, so hardly anyone would observe how or when it's done, even as salt conveys its own savor to that which it seasons without any noise and without being outwardly observed. If so, although we do not go out of the world, yet we may lie hidden within it. We may thus far keep our religion to ourselves and not offend those we cannot help. 
I will show that so long as true religion abides in our hearts, it's impossible to conceal it, as well as absolutely contrary to God's design. It's impossible for any who have it to conceal faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus makes this plain by two comparisons. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. You Christians are the light of the world with regard to both your temperament and your actions. Your holiness makes you as conspicuous as the sun in the middle of the heavens. Just as you cannot go out of the world, so neither can you stay in it without your faith being obvious to other people. Love cannot be hid any more than light, and least of all, when it shines forth in action. Your patient well-doing, your meek suffering of all things for the Lord's sake, your calm and humble joy in the midst of persecution, your work to overcome evil with good will make you more visible and conspicuous. A secret, unobserved religion cannot be the religion of Jesus Christ. Whatever religion can be concealed, it's not Christianity, and it's not only impossible to conceal true Christianity, it's contrary to God's design. It has often been objected that religion does not lie in outward things, but in the heart, in the inmost soul, that it is the union of the soul with God and the life of God and the soul of a person. It is true that the root of religion lies in the heart, the inmost soul, but if this root is really in a person's heart, it has to put out branches. And these are the several instances of outward obedience which partake of the same nature with the root, and consequently are not only marks or signs, but substantial parts of religion. Religion which has no root in the heart is worth nothing, but religion with root in the heart is well pleased with all outward services which arise from the heart, with our prayers both public and private, our praises and thanksgivings, and with our offerings humbly devoted to him.